Thank you, Albert, for the introduction. Thank you all for coming to listen to this presentation. Just get my slides out. OK, um, the title of my presentation is uh, China as a world's technological leader. Is it a dream or is it a reality? Um, I don't necessarily um, have any strong views. It's very difficult to predict the future. But I'll present you with some um, ideas that a colleague of mine and myself have uh, drafted and we submitted. And it's, this paper has been published, um, basically looking at um, historical trends that have occurred in other countries, uh, notably the United States, and also another feature that we think will be um, influencing China's path to become a technological leader. All right, um, let's get started. This, as we know, China's been growing rapidly from 1979 onwards. It has obvious competitive advantages, like its population. And we all agree that it's developed um, over the last 30 odd years into an economic superpower. It's the second, world's second largest economy. Um, it's uh, flexing its muscles politically, militarily. So while we commonly think of China as being an economic superpower, we might even think of it as being a political superpower, uh, a military superpower. But how, to what extent or how often do we think of China as being a technological superpower? And that's a question that I would like to address in this presentation. So while the st story of China's economic ascent has been well told, heard, and understood, how about the story, is there a story to be told about the ascent of China in terms of technology? So before we go further, how do we measure technological leadership? I use these indicators here in this, in this talk. Um, R&D in intensity, which is a percentage of your GDP that a country spends on research and development. Uh, research and development related personnel, number of scientific publications, outputs a number of patent applications. So we have two inputs and uh, two outputs. A snapshot look at the strength of China's innovation system. The rate of spending on R&D outpaces overall economic growth. So despite the fact that China's been growing very rapidly, the rate of spending on R&D has e exceeded even that. In 2012, China spent 163 billion, or roughly 2%. In 2014, it was 2.06% of its growing GDP on R&D, placing it second in the world only to the US. In terms of R&D personnel, it has 3.2 million R&D personnel in 2012. And it turns out the largest number of undergraduate, postgraduate, and doctoral students in science, engineering, globally. Over the period 2001 to 2011, a 10-year period, China ranked second in the world in research output as measured by the number of papers published by Chinese scientists in research journals. It ranks seventh but it's rising in terms of citations for papers authored by Chinese scientists. And I mention citations because it's often commonly used as a measure of quality rather than just quantity. In 2012, China trailed only the US, Japan, and Germany in patent filings under the Patent Cooperation Treaty, the PCT, administered by the World Intellectual Property Office. In 2012, two largest telecommunication equipment manufacturers, ZTE and Huawei, ranked first and third respectively in worldwide ranking of top PCT applicants. At the US Patent and Trademark Office, the number of patent applications originating in China grew 18% from 2009 to 2010, a rate not matched by any other country. So despite these indicators, there's widespread, I'm sure even in this room, um, skepticism over China's ability to become a global technological leader. There exists considerable skepticism. George Gilboy, far, as far back as 2004, wrote in Foreign Affairs, the Chinese firms forego investment in long-term technology development and rely heavily on imported foreign technology and components. More recently, David Shambo of George Washington University said in, he said in 2012 that there are 10 weaknesses in corporate and human resources management to explain why Chinese companies are still taking baby steps towards parity and global business. Dan Bresnitz and Michael Murphy from Georgia Tech argued in 2011 that China settled merely on keeping pace with technological advances elsewhere which is a wide, widely held view, pursuing innovation in only later, less consequential stages of the production process. Thomas Friedman, some of the other authors I've mentioned earlier, you may not have heard of, but I'm, I'm pretty sure many more of you have heard of Thomas Friedman, journalist argued in September 12 that driving economic growth through entrepreneurship and innovation depends on a culture of trust, which is missing. There's a trust deficit, which is 
he argues, a lingering remnant of Maoism in mainland China. So, um, I think, my co-author and I think, that the aforementioned skepticism overlooks several important factors that we feel have positioned China to compete for global technological leadership. And these three factors are as follows. A large domestic market, its autocratic style of governance, so governmental power, and three, globalization. And these two factors, we argue, are not new. They are factors that we have seen unfold and influence the rise of the United States of America in the mid-1900s. A large growing domestic market, a strong government following the, world war, following the Second World War, both of these factors un played themselves out in the United States and helped it become the global technological leader, whereas this third one is new. Before I get to that, let's take a br brief look at technological leadership throughout history. If we consider the period from the British Industrial Revolution onwards, sort of uh, 1850 to, to the present, technology has been leveraged to attain competitiveness as well as economic and military leadership. Um, there's an economic historian in the United States at Northwestern, I believe, Joel Moker, who wrote a book, Technology as a Lever of Riches. It's been used as a, as a key to unlock wealth for economies, for companies, for individuals. So it's, it's, been, well, uh, it's been understood to have um, a strong impact on improving competitiveness as well as your economy and military. So over the 70-year period, period of the British Industrial Revolution, we saw advances it made in the United Kingdom in cotton, iron, and steel, and these advances acted as catalysts for other techno, in techno, for, acted as catalysts for technological change in other industries, which led to social change, political change, and so on and so forth. By the end of the Industrial Revolution, Britain had developed a considerable technological lead over nations. And if some of you may know, there's uh, the, the First World Fair, a tradition that we continue today. Shanghai held a, a, a World's Fair uh, several years ago. The first World's Fair was held in 1851 in a magnificent glass building in Crystal Palace, an area of London. And uh, it was attended by merchants, entrepreneurs, and capitalists. And it was showcased to the world what technology can lead a country to achieve, including this magnificent glass building, like I said. Um, after Great Britain, Germany began to industrialize, and so did France. Uh, but from the turn of the 19th century, the torch of global technological leadership, if you'd like to call it that, like we ha have a torch for the Olympics, shifted from Europe to the United States. And the United States is undoubtedly the global technological t leader today, but some would argue its status is being threatened by China. By the First World War, American firms, especially in chemical and electronics, had established first-class industrial research and development labs. So this feature, industrial R&D labs, uh, distinguished the American experience from the British or the European experience. R&D labs that were insulated from more immediate corporate pressures to, sh to solve shop for problems, they could instead devote themselves to creative thought and invention and uh, new ideas. Post Second World War, American dominance was due to advanced technology. We saw after the Second World War the rise of large US corporations as they pioneered mass production techniques, Ford motor cars, assembly line, standardized product, and the long production run. From the mid-1900 onwards, large US corporations developed a clear technological edge in global production and trade. So from that period onwards, particularly, the US is viewed as a leader and other countries as followers in the catching up hypothesis, um, which is a theory in economics. But I remember going to China uh, when I was 17 or 18 years old, and, and the tour guide even once mentioned that the 1800s was a British century, the 1900s the American century, and the 2000s, perhaps, hopefully, um, the Chinese century. But here I, I, I show how, um, I, I try to briefly describe how American dominance was achieved post-Second World War. After that period of the Second World War, um, American leadership in terms of uh, techno technology has not remained uniform and it was threatened most notably in the 1980s by Japan. Japan's focus on innovation and technological advance propelled it into the leadership position definitely within Asia and maybe um, for a short period of time at least in the 1980s globally. The, inix the initial explanations to describe Japan's ascent focused on simplistically on copying, imitating, importing foreign technology and so forth. And I find these, inter these, these reasons interesting not least because many of them are used to describe 
China today. But with the passage of time, this explanation that they were just merely cop Im imitating, copying, or importing foreign technology was no longer adequate. It gradually became clear that the correct explanatory factors were higher technological sophistication of new products and processes, shorter lead times, rapid diffusion of new technologies, and integration of R&D, and so forth. After Japan, smaller countries are, throughout the world have focused their attempts on taking a slice of the technological leadership pie, if you'd like. And these smaller countries include Israel, Sweden, Denmark, the Nordic countries. In Asia, we have Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore, Finland in, in Europe. But no country has, has, can claim to be the global technological leader. So the reason why China can perhaps assume that mantle is, like I said, um, due to these three factors. And I'll go through each of these three factors individually now. First of all, uh, market size. Market size is an important determinant of innovation activities. The greater the demand, the greater the revenue, and the greater the incentives that companies have to innovate, to improve their products, to make their products better if they know they can sell to a larger audience. More efficient the production process, greater the aggregate cost savings, and this implies a growing market with growing demand will lead to increasing returns from investment in innovation. So basically, the larger the domestic market, the larger your market, the more incentivized companies will be to create new products to reap increasing returns. So as I mentioned earlier on when I began this presentation, this is a factor that played out in the US. Following the Second World War, United US, large US companies also benefited from selling to the world's largest domestic market at that time, which was American, the American market. These American firms led the world in developing and implementing leading edge technologies and claimed largest worldwide share in many export goods. So the American dominance in mass production industries, a dominance that resulted from ready access to natural resources and the world's largest domestic market, is noteworthy. So these American companies were resource and capital intensive, and they manufactured on a scale that was much larger than their counterparts, especially in Europe. Due to, due to the economies of scale that the American firms enjoyed, innovations from Europe were developed and brought to market in the US and not in Europe. And the similar, and I think similar dynamics will play out in the massive Chinese market, where the middle class has been growing. People talk about this as possibly being a threat, a uh, uh, middle income trap. China has strengths in mass production techniques that is already refined and, and uh, um, had a lot of experience in. They're able to adapt Western techniques to Chinese conditions. China's emergence as a rapidly growing major market offers it a unique advantage for technological advancement. The fact that they do have ready access to the world's largest domestic market incentivizes Chinese companies to innovate. The likes of which no other nation, aside from the United States, in the mid-1900s has enjoyed up to this point. Local Chinese firms are best situated to satisfy the singular tastes of the Chinese market. So WeChat, classic example, being much more popular than WhatsApp, for example, in terms of Chinese consumers' expectations regarding price, quality, and product features. So the integration of mass production strength with the world's second largest economy has led forecasters such as Goldman Sachs, Standard Chartered Economist, to predict the Chinese economy will be twice as large as the US economy of 2030. Maybe this will come to pass, maybe it won't. That's not my main concern. My main concern is that if these forecasts prove true, the capacity of Chinese firms to continuously leverage the advantage of their large home market to enhance their technological competitiveness will be a major success factor. Having access to the world's largest domestic market will be a major factor in allowing China to achieve these forecasts if they do come to pass. The second of the three competitive advantages that China has is um, an autocratic style of government, strong government power. Um, if you look at uh, the development of innovation systems, not the development of economies, if you look at the development of innovation systems, strong innovation systems throughout the world have developed with large investments committed by government. Having a strong government in a certain period of time has led economies to develop their innovation system, not their economy, not economically per se, but in terms of innova innovation capacity. So usually what happens is that governments play a leading role and their role decreases over time and private businesses play a, a smaller role and their role concomitantly increases over time. And the Chinese government, as we all know, is highly involved in the economy and highly 
interested in prom promoting and pursuing uh, paths towards more innovative production techniques. On the way to becoming global technological leaders, Chinese companies have benefited significantly, as we know, like I said, from Chinese government's industrial policy. They're very heavily involved in the economy with their state-owned enterprises. Chinese government's industrial policy is unmatched in scale and strength by Western standards. It's difficult to find any, any country uh, in, in um, the dem democratic West which can claim to have uh, uh, such a strong, heavy hand played by the government. In fact, this is not new either. This is not new. China has adopted the US model to boost their own state-backed R&D investments. And this was a model that was adopted by the US for a certain period of time after the Second World War. The success of high-tech industries in the United States post-war era reflected massive private as well as public investments in R&D and scientific and technical education made after the Second World War. The university that I graduated from with my PhD, Cornell University, is, another, is just one example of that. A land-grant university created by the government in the 1800s to try and promote agricultural research. Given the Chinese autocratic system of governance, China is able to steer Chinese state-owned and private companies to increase their R&D investments. And this has been reflected in the amount of money spent on R&D in China. So the percentage of uh, the R&D intensity, the percentage of uh, their GDP that they spend on R&D has been increasing and it has been led by the Chinese government. Now, the Chinese government, if you look at the statistics and if you believe the statistics, Chinese government is playing a, a lesser role, but it all began with the Chinese government playing a very heavy handed role. And in some areas, they continue to deploy that heavy hand. The use of industrial policy to help domestic companies upgrade technological capability had the roots in the United States and the Hamiltonian economic philosophy, which holds that a big country, such as the United States at that time and, and even now, needs big organizations to succeed and that the federal government should partner with private enterprise to finance scientific research and provide resources, infrastructure that businesses lack. Basically, what does this mean? It means developing the innovation system, providing the infrastructure and provide resources that businesses lack, that businesses are unable to create by in and of themselves. Under this Hamiltonian approach, American government sponsored projects such as the Erie Canal, Transcontinental Railroad, land grant universities, and a network of airports that we see today. And this helped create within the US a huge interconnected marketplace that ha also had an influence on innovation. And companies such as Standard Oil, General Motors, US Steel, General Electric, and Sears Roebuck prospered and grew under this philosophy in this period of time, which is, I'm talking about mid-1900s. The US government and the military led the way in financing innovation in its early stages. Government finance research and procurement fueled industries that produce the hybrid seed, the radar, synthetic rubber, the microchip, GPS, the internet, and so forth. So many of these came from the military, others came from government financed, sponsored research. Most of the centralized power that enabled China to run a planned economy, as we know, remains in place today. The government is able to play a significant role in shaping increasingly market-oriented activities. So although the activity might be market-oriented, the government nevertheless is able to play a strong role. The Chinese government has more policy instruments. This makes uh, China, this puts China in a position that is unrivaled by its Western counterpart because it has more policy instruments at its disposal than do other advanced, mature innovation systems of the West, which in turn enables the government to facilitate technological learning on the part of indigenous firms. With beneficial policies, Chinese government has bolstered the wind turbine industry, strategic emerging technologies, which includes environmental technology, telecommunications, biotech, advanced manufacturing, renewable energy, advanced material, and green vehicles. And what are these policies that this strong, heavy hand of the government is implementing? These policies include large-scale government grants, tax concessions, easy access to bank loans, and you know this could come back and bite. Um, as we know, the co corporate debt is a huge problem in mainland China now. Policies regarding intellectual property, standardization. And this is the set of policies that the Chinese government has been able to deploy, which will possibly allow it to create large companies that are also innovative in the same way that we saw in the United States post Second World War. So China is the second largest performer of R&D globally, accounting for 12% of the, of, of the global total. The United States is the largest with 31%.
The pace of real growth in China's overall R&D expenditure over the period 1999 to 2009, a 10-year period, has been exceptionally high at 20% annually, much more than the rate of economic growth. Another feature of, uh, related to the autocratic system of governance is the launch in 2006, 10 years ago, of its national mid- and long-term science and technology <coughs> development plan for the period 2006 to 2020. This plan um, demonstrates remarkable foresight, and I put this in red, that it demonstrates remarkable foresight because you don't see any other emerging country like Brazil, like Russia, like India, like South Africa, like Indonesia, implementing such a long-term plan despite their similar economic status, um, and China did. In the plan, the R&D expenditure to GDP ratio is, raised to two point, is to be raised to 2.5% by 2020, a figure that they're well on their way to achieving. And the plan proposes indigenous innovation, which represents the Chinese leadership's ambition to sustain economic growth through locally-led um, innov innovative activities and increased government-led R&D investments. There is, of course, concern in the West, in the United States and elsewhere that Beijing's visible hand is giving China an unfair advantage because China is not playing fairly by the rules of international trade. And this, too, perhaps is a symptom of the Chinese Communist Party's style of governance, where a heavy hand combined with secrecy prevails. So it's not, I don't mean to say this, if China does achieve the mantle of global technological superpower, it will be plain sailing, that it won't be criticized, it will, there won't be any obstacles in the road. But there are some factors, if we look back historically, that mimic the factors that the United States experienced. The third and final factor that the United States was not able to exploit, that China is able to exploit, is globalization. Intensified forces of globalization. Now, this allows Chinese companies to reach the frontier much more quickly than they would otherwise have had to. And how are they able to do that? Because in a globalized era, Chinese companies need not develop every cutting edge technology on their own. Rather, they can undertake mergers and acquisitions, M&As, as a deliberate strategy for acquiring advanced technologies owned by foreign firms. And they have been doing that very um, enthusiastically. As early as the 10th five-year plan from 2001 to 2005, Chinese government unveiled its Go Global strategy to encourage Chinese companies to invest abroad. However, China's outward foreign FDI accelerated only after 2009. So even though it was, it was presented in the 10th five-year plan as far back as 2001 to 2005, this only took off over the last six or seven years. In 2010, China's outward FDI amounted to 68 billion, ranking it fifth in the world. And the goal of many, not all to be sure, but many outward FDI projects has been to acquire advanced technology. And here in the remaining slides for this section of my presentation, I just give you some illustrative examples. Lenovo Group struck two deals in close succession in early 2014. In January 2014, they bought IBM's low-end server business for 2.3 billion. This is a small typo, I'm sorry. In February, they bought Google's Motorola handset division for 2.9 billion. These acquisitions further remodeled Lenovo as a force in mobile devices, in addition to data. Positions them to challenge largest global tech firms such as Apple and Samsung. In the automotive industry, Beijing Automotive Industry Holding Company Limited, BAIC, acquired the IPRs, intellectual property rights affiliated with Saab vehicles and engines, a Swedish car manufacturer owned by General Motors. Its entire R&D facilities, quality management systems, supplier development management systems in 2009. BAIC's objective in acquiring Saab was to integrate Saab's technology into its future R&D operations to develop an indigenous BAIC vehicle, which was launched in September 2014. Another automotive example, Chinese car maker Geely completed the acquisition of another Swedish manufacturer, uh, automaker, Volvo, from Ford Motors in August 2010. Geely needed Volvo's technology in order to improve the quality of its own brand of cars because of increasing local competition. Geely requires Volvo engineers to help it improve its engineering capabilities, and Geely owns all of Volvo's key technologies and intellectual property rights, and also has the right to use the intellectual property right. So the value of this acquisition was the intellectual property. In aviation, China Aviation Industry, General Aircraft, CAIGA, the largest general aircraft manufacturer in China, acquired US-based Cirrus aircraft 
in 2011. And the purpose of this was to develop a new single engine vision jet. In renewable energy, the R&D alliance between China's Sinovel and US-based Wintech in 2008 allowed Sinovel to produce the first five and six megawatt turbines in 2010 and 2011. Chinese company Goldwind, another uh, wind um, in, in renewable energy, acquired 70% ownership of German-based Vensys Energy in 2008, allowing it to access the world's leading technology and professionals in the area of permanent magnet direct drive wind turbines, a, an area that would, um, Goldwind was very weak in up to that point. In machinery, Sani Group, China's largest construction equipment manufacturer, acquired a German um, manufacturer of high-tech concrete pumps in January 2012 for its cutting-edge technology. In energy, CNOC acquired Canadian oil producer Nexon for 15 billion in February 2013 and Sinopec. And this provides, these acquisitions provide Chinese firms with advanced production technologies to draw oil and gas from non-traditional areas such as deep water fields and hardened rock formations more efficiently. So what are the implications for emerging markets for all of this? Um, I'm a faculty associate with, with the Institute for Emerging Market Studies, so just a few brief words on that. There exists plentiful opportunities for emerging market firms to partner with or invest in Chinese firms and R&D facilities. So if we are the Philippines, we are the Indonesias, we are the Malaysias of this region, we need not necessarily go to the West for all our um, uh, needs in terms of upgrading our R&D facilities, our capabilities. Corporate executives in emerging markets should expand their horizons beyond the traditional S&T superpowers such as the US, Japan, and Germany. In China, opportunities will abound in industry and academia for cooperation, for investment, for sourcing. For cooperation in science and technology applied research, for investment in R&D partnerships, for sourcing technological sophisticated manufacturing components. Not only will emerging market firms find it cheaper to move into China, since some of them are Asian, they will also find possibly uh, greater cultural affinities there. The knowledge and products that result from such cooperation will be closer to market for domestic consumption for these emerging markets, especially for those located geographically closer to China. And many emerging markets are indeed in China, although obviously not all. Emerging market firms that partner with Chinese firms and or universities to conduct R&D or manufacturing in China will be able to take advantage of China's growing and improving science and technology infrastructure and human capital and to be closer to what is soon to be potentially the world's largest consumer market. Okay, to conclude, a few slides here. Um, I think, the, like I said when I began my presentation um, 30, 40 minutes ago, um, the story of, ec of China's economic ascent has been well told, but the story of China's technological ascent is less well understood. Um, there exists good reason to believe that Chinese multinationals may, in fact, um, rise to position of global technological leadership. To be sure, Chinese, some Chinese companies have benefited enormously from the monopolies granted by Beijing and continuous improvement of Chinese firms' technological strength relies on political stability in the country. However, more of this technological rise can be attributed to the three factors that I, 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 I discussed. Growing domestic market, strong government support, and the intensified forces of, global, of globalization. Combined and individually, these factors help explain how and why Chinese companies will move beyond the traditional reliance on low factor input costs to scale the value added chain. And if they do that, they will realize the country's development and strategic goals based on its burgeoning technological strength. I think the, the globalization factor, the, the MNA cases are particularly insightful because they indicate the extent to which technology transfer to China is now taking place across a broad swathe of industries automobile, renewable energy, um, aircraft, and so on and so forth. In the past, Chinese companies, especially when China had just opened up in, the 19, in 1979, in the 1980s, and during that period, Chinese companies had to be content with acquiring technology through license agreements or joint ventures with foreign partners. And one of the most frequent complaints heard at that time was that these arrangements limited the use of technology by the Chinese firms that the foreign partners were not disclosing what their what the true core technologies were, the true value of their, of their companies. However, when a Chinese company, through the forces of globalization, merges with or acquires an overseas counterpart outright, it owns the underlying technology, which they can then use as it wishes domestically or internationally. 
Furthermore, overseas acquisition, acquisitions sorry, represent a point of pride in China, showcasing its economic strength, signaling both Chinese triumph and the decline of its Western counterparts. So it's, it has a feel-good factor to it. But globalization is only one of the three factors that I, I, I discussed and combined. These three factors um, possibly point to a future in which the global technological leader is, in fact, mainland China. That's, that's all for my presentation. I'll be happy to take questions. Would you like to moderate? Yeah. Thank you.